I'm Bob Rosenfeld. I'm uh, sort of on the program committee. And uh, I'm here to welcome you to this afternoon. But I wanted first for our members uh, to hear some sad news. Uh, one of our most important members over all these years, Raju Nuquist, died a couple of days ago. And uh, this organization would not be what it is without the contributions that she's made over the last 15 years. So um, I just want you to know about that, and we'll have some information for you about the memorial service coming up in a little while. Um, in addition to being on the program committee for many years, I do also help to start refreshment idea. She was a part of everything that we did, and she was a model for me when I took over some of these roles. So I was especially. I'm glad for the chance to have to say that, but I'm happy to have to say that this time. Uh, in terms of regular business, this is our last talking lecture for this semester. The next three programs, which will finish out the semester, are films at the Savoy, and they're at 12.30 Wednesdays. So these three films are connected by the introductions of Rick Winston, who always puts these together as a series. They are films all by the Dardenne brothers, who are from Belgium. And we will see how their career developed over a period of years through these three films. Um, the one next week is called La Promesse, a father who traffics and exploits illegal immigrants comes into conflict, conflict with his teenage son. That was a film from 1996. Then we'll see a film that they made in 2005. Then we'll see a film that they made in 2016. So that will be fun. And this is also my uh, last chance to thank the Senior Center for giving us this lovely space for the semester. We'll be here again when we start up again sometime in January. And now uh, I'll introduce Peter. But where is he? There he is. We'll tell us about this. Hi, I'm Peter Rumanier. And what a great way to end the lecture series here to have it on the snowy day. Uh, and um, so we really appreciate your coming out today. Uh, before introducing our great speakers today, I want to remind you of the Village Project Survey of Aging in Place for those who are 50 and living in Mont Montpelier. Uh, there is a survey box out there where you can, you can write up the survey and put it in there. So please do that if you're so inclined. Uh, we want to hear from you. Um, today we have uh, the pleasure of communing with a uh, a native of Baltimore who has spent substantially his entire life in New England. 25 odd years in Maine, and then about 20 years ago um, coming to Vermont. Baron Wormser has been his entire life a writer, a teacher of writing, a poet, and observer. He uh, continues to write and I'm excited about telling you about a book he just published, which I got the other day, called Legends of the Slow Explosion. <clears throat> One of the books that Barron will be able to sell, for you, sell to you here. This is an extraordinary uh, view of luminaries in our lives, wh whether it's Rosa Parks or Anna Arndt or Philip Berrigan, to live through them using Barron's imagination, uh, an extraordinary way of looking at history. Um, uh, Barron's a modest fellow. He, uh, he will um, share with you what, he, um, what he's been writing about recently and in the past. I'll leave it to him to, just, to introduce his work more carefully. But at this moment, Barron, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter.
Thank you. Uh, thank you for turning out this uh, snowy afternoon. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to, uh, my, talk, my talk and reading uh, focuses on biography, writing about um, people. When, you know, on a mass sometimes, what do you write about? Um, and my answer is pretty simple. I write about people. Um, of course, that doesn't really say much of anything. Uh, because it's such an enormous, enormous topic. I was thinking about sort of where I come from today uh, to, to explain a bit about uh, where I've wound up in this book, Legends. And um, when I was a boy uh, growing up in Baltimore, um, I've, I frequented the, the library there, uh, Branch Library of the Enoch Pratt Free Public Library in Baltimore. and. Um, I must have read my way through who knows how many biographies um, when I was a boy. Uh, so I, 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 could, I could see these books, some of them right in front of me. Um, I can remember some of the publishers who, of course, have uh, since uh, passed into uh, whatever, publishing oblivion. Um, Dodd Mead, Bob Zamerl. Um, uh, Random House is still around, uh, landmark books. Anyway, I read just every biography I get my hands on. So, um, so, so I can't tell you a lot off the top of my head, say, about Luther Burbank, you know? But I read about Luther Burbank. Um, George Washington Carver. Um, and, you know, then a few ladies, right? Joan of Arc, you know? Anyway, I read a ton of these books. Uh, you know, when I was a kid. So, um, so instinctively, I was interested. Um, and, you know, those, those, those are interesting books because, um, you know, there's dialogue in those books, you know? Well, nobody knows what George Washington Carver was really saying to someone on a given day. But, um, so, you know, that's kind of part of what I'm talking about today, really, and what Peter alluded to is this whole, whole issue of imagination. When you write, when you write about people, um, so that, that's I think one component that went into what I've been doing over a lifetime. And then another one is um, Shakespeare. I, I think it was in the eighth grade, Mr. Velder, um, that I first uh, read Shakespeare, and pretty sure we read Julius Caesar and um, Macbeth. And I just remember sort of feeling, wow, what, what is this? This is not like the Bob's Merrill biographies <laughs> of Florence Nightingale. Something else is going on here. Um, and of course, what was going on was, uh, was drama and, and even tragedy. Um, very different you know, from the comedies. You know, right away, you know, when you look at Shakespeare, you think, wow, they're all named after People, they're all names, you know, Macbeth, Julius Caesar, Othello, you know, they're all people. You think, well, the comedies are, are situations, as you like it, 12th. So there's, there's a real difference going on there. So, so that, that, that came in there, too. And then um, another, the, sort of the big aspect, which is where I'm going to begin today with you, is poetry. Um, I'm one of those people who uh, poetry is really my natural language, not prose. Um, so, so it's instinctive for me. My, my head works associatively, I think, in terms of images and metaphors. And um, so, so, so I've been writing about people in poems for sort of forever and reading other poets, you know, forever who, you know, write about people. So I'm going to begin today with a few poems to sort of give you a feeling. Now, of course, the differences are enormous. You know, obviously, I mean, I was just talking with a friend who just read the recent biography of Ulysses Grant, right? It's about a thousand pages. Well, you know, that's a lot of pages, you know. Um, whereas a poem is, what, 20, 30 lines, you know? So, so you know, and I, I always tell my, my, my brethren, my colleagues, where I teach and have taught, that, you know, a poem is really the equal 
of a biography or a novel. And they're not really excited to hear that, you know? Because you look at a poem and it, you know, it's like, how long did it take you to write that, you know? Um, in fact, it could take quite a while. But a, po a poem, of course, is what? A poem is about essence. That's what a poem is, it's about essence. So, um, so I'm gonna read you a couple today about people, and then I'm gonna read you one of the pieces from Legends, talk a little bit about that, and then read. Um, so I'm gonna um, begin with my most recent book, Unidentified Sighing Objects. Um, far be it from me to resist a pun. And um, I'm gonna begin, begin with a poem about an artist. Um, um, this is about uh, the great photographer, Diane Arbus, uh, Diane to her mom. Um, when she was uh, you know, a kid, an early adolescent, you know, you know how adults ask you, what do you wanna be when you grow up? And her answer was, I want to be a great sad artist. Which right away, you know, my kind of person, you know, so, so no, no wonder I've always adored her. So this is about Diane Arbus, and it's called Ode to the Great Sad Artist, Diane Arbus. Look, 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 around her neck, the noose of the camera, implacable, indifferent, dull, magical, like a porter at a gate, interceding. She stands at a gate. She carries the world on her back, a pack of unwholesome toys. The porter smiles, sneezes, sneers. Take this, she says. See that? The porter yawns. What is beautiful is awful. What is awful is beautiful. Perhaps Goethe said that, and a teacher told her. She holds the camera to her chest. Can it hear her? Oh, cheap omnipresence. How does she dare to cramp the unholy world to usher existence into a pew, to tailor the measurements of infinite space? Hush, she says, hush. The tall man, the thin man, the fat woman, the short woman, the bearded woman, the elevator man, the flower woman, the human wreck, the human pin cushion, the human map, the seal boy, the wolf girl, the chicken man, the bear woman, the woman who is a man, the man who is a woman. Everyone walks down a street. Everyone goes home at day's end and light something against the night, while the great sad artist welcomes the absence of clarity, inserts a flashbulb in her apparatus, sits at the kitchen table, and broods over the dreams of strangers, the grief that tunnels under the skin the smooth mask of perturbation, the bodily home that is no home. She will find everyone out. She will hold a moment. Who has done that? Achilles, Hector, Gilgamesh, Roland, who has held a moment and not let go? She can be her own myth, but she cries and puts her head down on the table there is no one to cheer her up except a machine that makes everything worse, that piles woe upon adroit woe. While she scrambles up the side of a building, a bridge, a face, a cloud, fearful but alert, not Achilles, Hector, Gilgamesh, Roland, but a woman in a dress. Click, click, click. Everything must be lost. All this careful finding must be lost. Only that makes the great sad artist 
smile. Only that. Okay, so that, that, you know, that's obviously a lot that's getting put in. And you know, when you, when you write about someone, one of, the, one of the crucial questions is, where do you begin, right? And there's no answer to that question, right? I mean, so many biographies that I read again as a boy begin with, George Washington Carver was born in yada dada, you know? Well, yeah, but no. Because of why? Because there's so much what? There's so much history. There's so much backstory, right? Um, and that's what I faced in writing these biographies in this book. Um, I'll, re I'll read you uh, one more poem. Now, um, this will be from another book. Um, and this will be, again, I'll read one uh, about a poet. Uh, this is about Walt Whitman. Um, in the Civil War, as probably some of you know, Walt Whitman was a sort of nurse companion to soldiers in Washington who, um, who um, were wounded and uh, often were, were really not much more than boys, you know, 16, 17 years old. Farm boys had never been away from home. Um, and some of them, you know, were dying. Um, so Whitman uh, came into the hospital uh, in Washington and both Confederate and Union soldiers, of course, he sat, sat by both of them and, um, and was with them. So this is about, this is about that. So it's about, who, you know, again, you know, the question I've been asking my whole life as a writer, um, which poets particularly ask, is um, what is that? You know, it's the, it's the child's question, right? If you, you know, you're around children, they're always asking, what is that? And you're supposed to answer that, you know? For his part, Walt Whitman, 1863. The soldiers in the hospital asked Walt Whitman to tell them the story that would make the hurt go away. The story about trust and reward. They knew he knew the story. He was a poet and perforce, as poets once put it, belonged to the tribe of the availing Odysseus, a voyager in every weather of the soul. For all his love, he winced. He knew the words they wanted and sought to avoid those words. He had been another singer, one from the earth. The sky was empty and distant. There was no human home there. It pained him to have to speak that story. He touched a forehead, placed a quiet kiss on a pale cheek, and murmured simple words that caressed the honor of their pain, the sweetness of the most mangled flesh. Perhaps they believed the poet. Perhaps for a time, the sky bowed to the earth. Wings became legs. Words became more than earnest sounds. The poet, for his part, never turned away. He saw his poems in the saddest eyes and the briefest, most hopeless smiles. The poet voyaged to the edge of human warmth and held the hand as it turned cold. That was the poem the poet had always known and from which he never turned away. Okay, so, so that's, a, that's about essences. So, um, so when I started writing these biographies that went into this, this book, um, I knew I still wanted to get at essences, but I wanted to write prose. I wanted to do something more, more extended. So I sort of took what I learned, so to speak, over the course of these decades of writing poetry, and um, you know, I started writing these prose pieces. Um, and they're about really, as Peter said, they're about really, really different people. But they're all, all the lives, and that's why the book's called Legends, all the lives 
have sort of an imaginative story to tell us about who the person was, okay? Um, which is easy to lose in the world, you know, of facts and news. It's easy to sort of lose a sense of, well, what was that life about, you know? So that's why I, I wrote about these different people. Um, I wrote about these different people, too, because I've, I've been obsessed one way or another with these different people over the course of my life. Um, so I'm going to read one this afternoon, and then we can talk some about the piece and just generally about writing biography or other things on your mind. Um, but this, this one's, I, read, I read this one to you um, for a lot of reasons. But one, if you, the, the biographies are about people from the second half of the 20th century. It was plain to me, if you're writing about the world of after you know, World War II, more or less, you've got to write about the world of the movies. You've got to write about an actor or a director, someone. Because you know, it's just an, an extraordinary um, world. It wasn't there that each of us takes for granted, basically. So, uh, so, so I was always fascinated with Audrey Hepburn. And um, that's what I'm going to read you. Um, but you'll see where this one begins. Um, and it doesn't begin with, uh, you know, Audrey was born so and so. There is a story. A princess comes to Rome. She is tired of being a princess, which is so terribly official and so terribly boring, which could turn a vibrant young woman into a mannequin. She escapes from her entourage and falls asleep, much like a princess near the Colosseum. A journalist finds her there and allows her to spend the night in his place. Soon he recognizes who the woman sleeping in his apartment really is. The next day, he and a crony take her around Rome. At last, she feels free to gallivant, getting her hair cut, eating ice cream, and racing around on a motor scooter. The princess and the journalist fall in love that day, but it is only for a day. They must return to their lives and their obligations, and they do. There is a story. A woman is about to divorce her husband. She returns to her home in Paris to find it bare, stripped of every possession. Furthermore, her husband is dead. He was tossed off a moving train. Happily or strangely or coincidentally or all the above, the woman has met a man who shows up and says he will help her. Who is this man? This is where you all say, Cary Grant. <laughs> <laughs> he has many names. Meanwhile, the woman learns that her husband filched a fortune and that others believe she has that fortune. They are willing to kill to retrieve that fortune, but she doesn't know where it is. Over and over, she protests that she doesn't know where it is. She isn't lying. She seems incapable of lying. And there is a story. Two filthy rich brothers live in a mansion on Long Island. They are so rich, they have a chauffeur. The chauffeur has a daughter who has recently returned from Paris. Everything important in the world of emotion emanates from Paris, not from Long Island. <laughs> the young woman is beautiful, scintillating, and full of the most marvelous life. Which brother will end up with her? But more to the point, is she interested in either of them? She has been to Paris. They are used to looking down. Now they have to look up. These are stories that compose the plots of movies. But they are the stuff of fairy tales, too. Princesses, fortunes, wishes, and mistaken identities. 
They could not have happened, but on the screen, they do. That sense of impossibility coming true is the most delicious fabrication. For above all, movies purvey romance. There must be something heady and swooning and yet difficult that informs falling in love. There must be something magical because love is magical. No one knows where it comes from or how long it will last or whether both people will feel it. Love is the last incalculable. Lust is boorish and sweaty. Romance burns with a cool heat. It inspires wit. It fences with feelings. It is a prelude that may somehow become a full-blown, lifelong symphony every day shot through with deep kisses, or it may fizzle into indifference or contempt or revulsion. The swelling lyrical strings on the soundtrack only last so long. That, however, is the beauty of movies. They don't have to tell the whole story because no one really wants the whole story. <laughs> People sit there in the dark to inhabit the part of the story where the princess wakes up or the treasure is found or the brothers weep for love. The whole story is tedious. That's why there are artists to find the magic part of the story. I have a student at the moment who actually is involved in script writing and directing. And he said when he pitches his next move, he's going to quote that sentence. <laughs> There are endless competing stories, like the young girl who hid in an attic and could fight at her feelings to a diary, like the princess or the young woman who returned from Paris. She was full of life. It was all wrong that she had to hide, but there was no fairy tale within her story. Her story occurred in the bloody, shrieking maw of history. She was 15 when she died. No one even knew how many were murdered, nor could numbers have told you what it was like to hold your breath when you heard footsteps on the stairs or wish you could go outside to feel the wind in your hair or be shepherded to your pointless death. What are people supposed to make of that story? Are they supposed to continue with their daily tasks? Or are they supposed to say, this must not happen again anywhere? Or are they supposed to forget, as if the story of the girl with glasses and dark hair never happen? Or are the stories of wars and killings too much for the person who pushes some money forward and announces to the ticket seller, one, please? One mere person. When the Hollywood moguls insisted on a happy ending, they knew that one life could only support so much bleak weight. They knew that this was another beauty of the movies. They were weightless. They occurred on a screen suspended in darkness in midair. Even when they portrayed the eventual murder of a 15-year-old girl, there was something weightless present. The movies were another realm. They organized contrivance in ways that exceeded every known art. They possessed an inherent magic, a blend of machine and spirit no one had imagined before. No one would ever improve on that magic 
because like a mask or mummery, it was unique. Audrey did not grow up at the movies. She was born in the same year as Anne Frank, and she lived during the war in the same country. Their faces show the same delicate, irrepressible vitality. So again, as I read through this, one thing you might think about is when you're doing this, and again, it's like poetry, it's a bit like a recipe. You're putting in different ingredients, basically, to try to make a whole. It was brutally cold. There was no heat. They were rounding up people. There was no more food. You could hear rifle shots. It was the middle of the 20th century, and people were eating grass. They tried to make bread out of grass. The children cried and cried. People got very sick and died. Some people were taken from their homes and executed. Many homes were set fire to. People trudged along on roads, though they didn't know where to go. They had only their lives. They tried to hold on, but it felt that there was nothing to hold on to. Every lasting stay had fallen away. Every story had crumpled. If you have the emptiness of war in your stomach, you might save out a bit of food. Or maybe if you have food, you will gorge until you pass out. Either way, the emptiness will have consumed you. Audrey wanted to dance. There was that letting go and that spirited grace. This is how the body speaks, one of her teachers said. The poise came naturally to her amid the large and small tragedies, war and her father leaving when she was a little girl. Something in her grasp how precious balance was. The ballet poses emanated from classical attitudes, the joy of rigor. But what underlay those poses was the tenuous arc between the bearable and the unbearable. Great feeling was bound to wobble. Audrey was too tall to be a ballerina, and the war left her behind those who had continued to study. Still, she could dance. She was filled with springy, boisterous energy, and yet, unlike the century she was born into, she didn't believe in the genius of restlessness. For the 20th century, nothing could be merely harmless, old-fashioned, and even a bit charmed in the way that peasants once considered a tree or a star or a donkey to be charmed. For the 20th century, there had to be vanguards moving ever forwards and vanguards in front of vanguards. Death to Baba Yaga, death to simple Hans, death to Rapunzel, death to fairies and sprites and elves, fancy the Midsummer Night's talent for turning nothing into something was one of the century's first casualties. One of the wonders of this mere girl woman was her ability to stick out her tongue and make a face. If you can't make fun of what is important, you can't have fun. Instinctively, children know that. It's part of how they survive but adults too often prefer the future to the now. They have sworn sacred oaths, they have consecrated tasks, they have class enemies, ethnic enemies, tribal enemies, religious enemies. They have powerful words that could both summon and unleash loathing. A child intuits all this wretched seriousness in adults, their wrenched faces and tight words. In her plucky way, the child mattered much more than the men on podiums, haranguing crowds, and commanding armies. They can murder her, of course, the way they murdered Anne Frank. But though they can try, they can't murder 
everyone. One of the wonders of Audrey was her ability to make fun of herself. She could let her ego pass by. Between who she was and who at any given time she might become, there was a movable distance that nurtured and settled her. She could play a princess or daughter of a chauffeur with equal ardor. She possessed within her narrow body great latitude. When in a hotel, this is a true story, when in a hotel in Monte Carlo, Colette, you know, the great French writer, recognized Audrey as the perfect Gigi for a forthcoming Broadway version, a total, utterly unpredictable happenstance, it made perfect sense. Audrey was waiting, but not waiting. She was simply present. Colette wrote that Audrey was piquant. More than once, Colette had stuck out her sly tongue. She knew what she was looking for. Audrey protested. She had never acted on the stage. She had been a Corrine and bit player in a few not very good movies. Doubt and honesty made a tandem inside of Audrey for a lifetime. Colette, who would have not been a bad choice as a role model for a female deity, reassured her. In her worldly way, Colette understood how the 20th century needed female deities desperately. Piquant was part of the description. So were graceful, resilient, candid, and marvelously vital, a pure spark of the life force. Sometimes the word worship was used to define the adoration a movie star like Audrey could elicit. An embarrassing word, but an understandable one, not because the screen was famously larger than life, but because the camera showed people in a way people had never before been shown. Audrey's face with its delicacy and seeming guilelessness was meant for close-ups. It wasn't that she had extraordinary dramatic range so much as an ability to convey tiny moment-by-moment -moment shifts in her being. There was no great rage or pity in her. There was, however, a talent for being herself, even as she was being someone else. A deity can't do that. A deity is stuck, cursed with omnipotence. People can believe or disbelieve, but a god, to say nothing of the monotheistic god, is timeless. If modern times were bereft of greater certainties, the shifts of actors on screens offered an uncanny degree of recompense. Two or so hours of agreeable oblivion did not equal salvation. But Audrey had seen what the Nazis did to prayers. She was patient as she went through take after take with fussy directors like William Wyler, but she had no patience for male sanctimony. When, as often happened in her movies, a man began to lecture her, you knew she was waiting beneath a smile or pout to dish it back to him. She didn't trust in the world that men had made. If, as an actress, no one asked her for an opinion beyond clothes and what is Gregory Peck really like, that only showed the poverty of thought that surrounded her. Her pretty head was much more than pretty. Truman Capote complained that Audrey wasn't the right actress for breakfast at Tiffany's. But Truman Capote liked to complain. It was one way he knew he was alive. Peak was his oxygen. Supposedly, Audrey played a call girl in the story, but there was little to no hint of, in the movie made from, of sex in the movie made from Capote's book. Holly Golightly's modus operandi was to duck out to the ladies' room after taking 50 bucks from the guy and not come out. It wasn't a great way to spend your life. 
but it didn't seem to particularly matter to her. She lived in her imagination as much as she lived in New York City. The important human race was a humdrum bother to her. She was a romantic, which was to say a person who honored her feelings in a world that didn't honor feelings. There is nothing especially realistic in how Holly Golightly is portrayed. We don't see pissed off guys stave in the ladies room door or haggle about the specifics of her services. She is charming and thus adroit at keeping the world at bay. That seems part of Audrey's core. The world will violate you one way or another. What happens after romance is the tedium of getting along with another person. In that sense, movies that delved into marriage had to be comedies of the sort the other Hepburn often starred in. One weighty, stupid, confused day must collide with another. Yet somehow or other, the wires of romance must be reattached. I'll read for about five minutes more and then we can talk some. So. I may get to the end and I may not. Holly Golightly is not one for marriage. Her comedy is about isolation, its pleasures and pitfalls. Holly must be saved from that state, no matter that she seemed quite okay staring in Tiffany's window all by herself, and that the love interest was George Papard who managed to be both preening and wooden at the same time. <laughs> Not a great actor, George Papard. Sorry. The two of them must kiss in the rain at the end of the movie to affirm romance, even though the beauty of Holly is that she doesn't give a rat's ass for the lower forms of romance. It isn't that she is hard. Audrey could never have portrayed someone who was hard. Holly's eye is set on a higher prize. Tiffany symbolizes that prize, but a viewer feels that more is going on with Holly and with Audrey than standing outside and in the early morning and looking at jewelry. Holly believes in beauty and style, and Audrey as Holly embodies that. The notion of Holly as merely a call girl, someone to fuck, is ludicrous. It isn't that Audrey isn't sexy. In her coy, breathless way, she is very sexy. A fellow Corrine who danced with Audrey at the beginning of Audrey's career lamented that although she, the Corrine, had, and I quote, the biggest tits on the stage, everyone's eyes were on Audrey. The ravishing truth was that Holly wasn't merely anything. She might portray a call girl, or a nun or a princess, but all those roles partook of what a fellow actor called her, and I quote, spiritual beauty. Right there in front of the camera, Audrey's role was happening, but something else was happening too, something rare. Amid the celebration of the external, that movies of necessity indulge, there was some internal spirit that was animating the call girl or the nun or the princess that not only would not equivocate, but could not equivocate. Spirit always steps in from another world. We don't know what that world is, because all we have to go on are intimations. There was Audrey's childhood and the pall of abandonment that attended her. 
a sort of luminous shadow. There was her native Elan. There was the feeling that she intuited more than ever could be put into language. And so her facial expressions formed a higher language. There was her voice, which at times was so girlish it might have floated away. There was the stark suffering of someone who has miscarried a number of times, who literally has lost life and been transfigured by grief. There was an edge that came from being treated roughly by human unkind. There was the awareness that emotion can't stop tanks and bullets, an awareness likely to breed a degree of both despair and hard-headed honesty. There was her physical presence, how at any moment she was in touch with the gestures of dance. Each movement could be precious. And there was something indomitable, at once tender and powerful and blind. She famously played a blind woman in the terrifying wait until dark her feel for the role of someone who refused to be powerless, yet was achingly vulnerable, was flawless. Okay, one more paragraph. Audrey kept the press at bay and lived most of the time in Switzerland, far from the picture-snapping crowd. She didn't want to be in that emptiest and silliest of categories a star. Like any serious person faced with the helter-skelter of modern circumstances, she wanted to find out who she was. Though it was a long way home, being in front of the camera helped her. Okay, so that's um, most of the way through, Audrey, a couple more pages there. So, so you, I hope that it gives you a sense of what I'm trying to do in this book. The people, as I say, are very different from one another. But basically, the question that I began with still pertains, which is, who is that person? You know, who is R.G. Hepburn? Who is Rosa Parks? And again, thinking about the imaginative quality of the person's life. Um, I'll open it up. but. Um, I'm working on a book now about um, one of the great imaginers of our era, Bob Dylan. And it's based on a sentence from an interview with Bob Dylan. And you know, a lot of what Bob Dylan says in interviews is just, um, how to say, um, elaborate and making fun of the person asking the question. But this one, I think, really came from inside him pretty deep. And the sentence is, imagination was what there was, and really all you had. And I think that sentence is you know, what I'm writing about in here. And if we stop and think, a sentence that has a lot to do for each of us with uh, you know, how we live, who we are, and what we're doing here. So, um, so I will open it up now if you have any um, Questions or thoughts or anything you want to bring up about my nominal topic of the day, writing about people, biography. Um, maybe you just read the 960 pages about Ulysses S. Grant. You want to talk about him. Um, so I'll open it up to questions, if you have questions. Sure. Who is that person, is what you said. Right. Do you think that you approach that I don't want to say objectively. No, what, I don't. What are you for when you <laughs> right, sure, that? sure, of course. Yeah. Um, well, we know that objectivity is a myth, right? The scientists have told us that one. So inevitably, there's a subjective element, which is a billion things conditioned who the biographer is, historical circumstance, right? You know, go read a biography of Thomas Jefferson from 30 years ago. 
and go read one where they found out what was going on in back of the mansion. Going to be a little different take on Thomas Jefferson, right? So, I mean, so, so history enters in to that, historical circumstance, you know? For me, I mean, it, it's basically, what are your values as a writer, really? So obviously, if you're a professional historian, then your values are what do you, as a professional historian. My values are empathy and imagination. Those are my values. And I'm happy to stand and fall with that, you know? Do I know what Rosa Parks was thinking? Of course not. How could I possibly? Um, Am I willing to try? Absolutely. <laughs> so that's the short answer to a big, big question. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. Peter? Um, tell us a little about the research you do in preparation for. Yeah, I read a lot of books. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't read all the books. I read a lot of books, you know. And I basically, I already had feelings about all these people. I wouldn't have written these pieces if I didn't have feelings to begin with, you know. So that's where it started. And then I just read enough to feel that I had sort of a hook, an insight, you know, into where I wanted to go with it. Because I, I knew I wanted to write about, as I say, essences, you know. I'm not telling the whole story. I'm not interested in the whole story. Um, so I just read enough to give me a feeling for what, you know. And that varied, you know, honestly, you know. And I mean, some of the, some of this, this brings up the point, you, I mean, some of this stuff, I mean, one of these is about James Jesus Angleton. I don't know if that name rings any bells with the audience, Angleton. Angleton was head of counterintelligence for, this, for the CIA in the 50s and 60s. So, I mean, you could read about Angleton, but there is no truth. <laughs> we don't know, you know? We'll never know, you know? Um, so it raises all kinds of issues that way, right away, right out of the gate, you know, in terms of, I mean, I read books about Angleton, but, I mean, you know, he was the keeper of the secrets. That's what they called him. So I read books, yeah. I did read, yeah. Questions? Five minutes more? Questions? Yep. Just more of a comment than, sure. than a question. When you were reading us the uh, Audrey Hepburn right. uh, part, I kept forgetting that it was prose. I kept thinking that it was poetry. Good. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you said you're, you're really a poet, and that sure. certainly came through even, sure. even with the prose. Yeah. Well, good. That's, that's, <laughs> that's all the prose books I've written. That's, you know, that's where I'm always trying to go. So, yeah, thank you. I was uh, thinking about uh, the nature of memory and what we can mm, sure. from the years in yeah. which we lived. The, yeah. uh, so, many, so many artists are doing retrospectives on the 20th century. Certainly there are so many things being written about. Those are the great wars. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and the new criticism that has evolved in the last 30, 40 years <coughs> tells us the point you were making that uh, reality is a construct. Amen. And each of us constructs ours. Right. And um, so, what are the boundaries? <laughs> um, what are the ethical boundaries? Constructing reality. Sure. I'll just add one little note. Sure. I went to a, a play at Portland Stage Company uh, that uh, was by, based upon the right, the lives of the Wright brothers. Mm. But it, it in no way respected any of the conventional rules mm -hmm. about yeah. biography. Sure. And it invented a wife that the two brothers shared. Yeah. And I found myself sitting in the audience, and I was just. Fury. Right. It was the first time I'd come up against sure. that emotion in myself about how dare you sure. take reality and right. shape it just to suit you or just to play with right. it. So are there rules or are there, <laughs> are there boundaries, Sarah? Where are we? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's the beginning of a week-long symposium. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, very, very, very briefly, okay, uh, it's a great question. 
Um, one of my uh, one of my writer friends, who is a um, nonfiction writer, he draws a line between truth and truthful. Okay, truth is. If you checked into the reha a rehab facility, there should be a record that you checked into a rehab facility. If you sit, write a memoir that you checked into a rehab facility and you tell people the name of it and they go check their records and you weren't there, that's untruthful. Now, if you are telling people it's a memoir, okay, and you were there, you are lying, okay? On the other hand, if you are writing about something and you couldn't, you weren't there, okay? But you have a strong feeling based on reading and intuition and empathy about what happened, you are being truthful, okay? But you are not saying this is, you know, swearing on a Bible, true. Now the issue you raise is a big one in terms of how is it presented, basically. In other words, my book is called Legends of the Slow Explosion. I'm telling you in the preface, these are, quotes legends, okay? So I'm not offering this as, you know, whatever, biographical gospel. But there's another huge issue that you bring up, which basically is how wide of a screen do you want to show when you're writing about someone, okay? And that's where things get really, really interesting, right? Because a good example is in most of the screens in terms of writing about history in particular, right? Well, for starters, there are no women in the screen. Well, what was with that, you know? None of us noticed. Right, right, <laughs> right. And there, were, and there were no minority groups. So, so I'm saying that uh, uh, that's a big one, is how... You know, and then people start to think, well, actually, the real story isn't the so-called real story. It's over there with someone on the margin, you know. So it's a great question, but a really complex, that's a very brief answer. There's a third point. Remember the moment when Stephen Colbert invented truthiness? <laughs> <laughs> right. Same terrain. And I think in our public life together now, we are still exploring this question. No question. <laughs> For better and worse. Um, I hope I'm not mistaken what my wife would have said had the dog not been sick this afternoon if she were here herself. She writes picture book biographies for children. And she'll find a person who has been very influential in her life. For example, take Leonard Bernstein and say, well, this would be interesting for children to learn about him. And then she learns more and more about parts of his life that would not be OK in a book for children. Right. So that's to her, sort of the screen right. thing. Um, how do you think about your Audience, is your audience you? Um, do you just say, nah, people don't need to know this? If you spend your life as a poet in America, yeah. you don't spend your life thinking about a quote's audience. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so, so no, that would, that would not, not, not pertain to me, no, honestly. OK, well, 2.30 it was lovely to be with you this afternoon. And, um, I do have some books for sale if you'd like to part with your hard-earned money. So um, thank you again.